Today, I'm gonna to show you 20 mistakes that might be ruining the sentences in your fantasy novel, along with how to fix them. Starting with mistake number one, time traveling reactions. If we read out this sentence here, his head rocks to the side from a strong backhand, dropping him to his knees. You can see there that the blue section is the action. However, the reaction of this character's head rocking to the side is actually happening before we describe the action that's making this thing occur. So really we should be rewriting the sentence to say, the backhanded blow rocked his head to the side and dropped him to his knees. It feels so much more logical and the sense of causality actually makes sense here. By the way, if you're wondering how I learned about the mistakes I'm covering in this video, over the past year I've edited around 800,000 words of fantasy stories for various writers. Also, whenever someone has applied for my story coaching program or my fantasy outlining bootcamp, I've required them to submit a 10 page sample of their writing. Now, I've had the great fortune of having hundreds of writers apply to be part of these programs, so you can do the math on how much fantasy prose I've critiqued. And of course, I've got my own stories that I've written and learned from as well. Next mistake is double negatives. So, take a look at this sentence. The warriors rarely fought without respect. Rarely and without are both negative phrases. And so both having them here kind of negates each other. If you just had the warriors rarely fought with respect, that would be one meaning. If you had the warriors fought without respect, that would also be the opposite. But because you have both of these terms together, you're basically canceling them out. So really, you should just be making this more concise and say the warriors fought with respect. And the general principle to pull out from this is that whenever you can say the same meaning, but with fewer words, it's usually a good idea to do it because it creates a greater sense of progress for the reader. And they feel like the rate of revelation in your story is higher. Now, the next mistake is something that I actually only discovered recently, and that is incorrect adjective order. So, there is actually a correct order to be using different adjectives in your story. And to provide a quick definition here, an adjective is a word that describes or modifies a noun or pronoun by giving additional information about its appearance, quantity, quality, or other attributes. And so usually we use adjectives to basically clarify or better describe a certain thing in our story. Take a look at this sentence here. Three circular, ancient, elvish, massive war shields hung in the hall. There's something that doesn't feel quite right about that sentence. And it's not just that we've stuffed it with a ton of different adjectives to describe these shields, but it's actually because these adjectives are in the wrong order. If we compare this sentence to this one, three massive, ancient, circular, elvish war shields hung in the hall, the second sentence just flows so much better. It just feels like it makes sense. Whereas this first one feels like we're kind of tripping over ourselves and the progression doesn't quite feel logical. And that's because there is actually a logical way that you should be listing out the adjectives whenever you're describing something. That is number one, quantity or number, quality and opinion, size, age, shape, color, proper adjectives, so nationality like elvish in this example here, place of origin, etc., and then the purpose or qualifier. So you can actually look, think about this in terms of a table here. So if we go through this table and go through these three examples, you get a much better understanding of how to correctly sequence the adjectives in your story. We've got three massive ancient circular elvish war shields, but you could also have the one true emerald ring. Again, this wouldn't make sense if I said the true one emerald ring, that would just feel a little bit strange. Uh, although I suppose if you really wanna emphasize the word true, maybe you can kind of go around this rule if you really, really know what you're doing, but you certainly wouldn't say the emerald true one ring, that just feels really strange, right? And then you've got an immense square pearly tower. So using this table can be a great way to just make sure that your adjectives are going in the correct order in your story. However, it's very important that you don't fall trapped to the next mistake, which is overindulging on adjectives. So adjectives are obviously really cool, but they are just one way to kind of describe things in your story. And sometimes I see new fantasy writers get carried away with this. They tend to use too many words to describe something because they want to paint a really vivid picture in their stories. And sometimes it's better to just be simple. So if we look at this example here, a single enchanted tiny new square silver dwarven healing ring, it just feels busy. It just feels like there's a lot of stuff here to describe this ring. And adjectives aren't your only tool for clarifying what something looks like in your fantasy story. You can also break it out into several sentences and statements like this. It was a silver dwarven healing ring. John studied it closely. The ring was square and stubby, and judging by the glow, it held an enchantment. So yes, this is a bit of a longer description, but I would say it does a better job of clearly conveying it to the reader. It doesn't feel as overstuffed and busy, and you've got a much better chance that the reader actually remembers all the key details about this ring when you break it up, as we have for this second example here. Sentence mistake number five are bubble wrap words. So you may have heard of these as glue words before as well, I like the term bubble wrap words and I'll explain why in a minute. Take a look at this sentence. 
Sandra felt her heartbeat grow faster. It's not a bad sentence by any means. There's a sense of conflict here. There's a sense of things changing and progressing in a meaningful way. But if we compare it to this sentence, Sandra's heartbeat quickened, you can just see that that second sentence is so much faster, it's more immediate, and it doesn't feel like we're having to slog through words that don't add meaning. So in the case here, you can see that felt, her, and then probably grow faster. In many ways, these are kind of these bubble wrap words. They're words that are useful to preserve the package of your story when you're sort of getting down that first draft, just like bubble wrap is. But once you've actually got the package, you wanna remove that bubble wrap and you wanna get, get rid of it so that you can actually just appreciate the particular item or object that you have there. In the same way, bubble wrap words are these things that we often use in our first draft just to get our ideas down on the page. But when you go through your editing and your second and your third and your fourth drafts and so forth, you should really be looking to try to cut them out as much as possible because if you have a sentence with a ton of bubble wrap words in it, it's gonna feel very sticky and it's gonna feel like the reader is having to slog through a lot of meaningless stuff to get to the true intent of the story. Coming over into Microsoft Word here, a really useful tool that I like to use to basically fix these bubble wrap words here, or as I said before, sometimes known as glue words, is Pro Writing Aid. So they're not sponsoring this video or anything, but I did manage to get a 20% discount link from them. So I'll link that in the description below this video if you wanna check it out. But basically they have all of these different uh, kind of editing checks that they can run on your writing. So if we look at the sticky one here, it's going to basically find all the glue words, or as I call them, the bubble wrap words in your story and it's gonna give you suggestions for how to kind of change these. So you can see that this example here, which is just kind of like a bad example that I've written quickly, um, certainly not intended to be an amazing piece of writing by any means, you can see here that it is very sticky. 63% of this sample uh, contains glue words. So words like in, the, of, the, was, a, small, and, that, by, etc. Um, and it's probably a little bit higher than where you want it to be. You're never going to be able to completely eliminate the glue words or the bubble wrap words from your writing, but in most instances, it's something where new fantasy writers have a tremendous amount of glue words that they need to get rid of. Because when I'm reading through story samples or when I'm editing different writers' works, I see that there's too much reliance on these words. And usually it's just because you don't know about these things, right? But now that you are actually armed with this knowledge, you'll hopefully have a much better chance of just streamlining your sentences and being much more direct and powerful with your writing. Take a look at this sentence here. Was he really going to throw his life away on a chance that she'd show mercy? Again, not a necessarily bad sentence, but if we look at this refined example, would he really throw his life away for this slim chance of mercy? You can see how much crisper that prose feels. It feels so much more direct. The emotions come across way more powerfully and way more immediately. And to give you a bit of a list of bubble wrap words to look for, we've got common words like articles, prepositions, conjunctions, pronouns, auxiliary verbs, and a bunch of miscellaneous terms as well. So these are all things that you can be looking for when you're trying to eliminate bubble wrap words. Like I said before, Pro Writing Aid is a really useful software for eliminating this stuff. Um, but I also like to sometimes just do a control search for some of these terms in my manuscript. And that will basically show me all the instances of these throughout a story. And then I can work to kind of refine these. And it's good to just kind of select one and then go from there. So for example, you might select the word um, there, and that's probably gonna come up a lot actually. Probably something like were is a better example. Select the word were, put it into Microsoft Word and basically search through your whole manuscript for it. And you won't need to eliminate every single instance of these, but even if you only take out like 20% of the words and you change the sentences to be a bit more direct and to have less of these bubble wrap words, it will really improve the quality of your prose. Now, the next mistake is something that gets me quite fired up. So I apologize for the rant in advance, but Take a look at this sentence here. It's supposed to be an action scene, right? He crashed through the door, the creature followed. It opens its mouth and snarled. Now, one of the most annoying pieces of advice that I see online about writing is that if you wanna create fast pacing, you should write short, punchy sentences because they're punchy, they make the action feel faster. And that is one of the biggest myths when it comes to prose. Just think about it, right? When you read a full stop, you pause for longer than you pause between words. And you pause at a full stop longer than you pause for commas. So if I take this sentence here, he crashed through the door and the creature followed him snarling. It's so much faster to move through the exact same ideas in this second sentence, because instead of having three full stops for us to get through, with each one of those probably being about a one second pause if a narrator is reading this out as an audiobook, this example here only has one full stop and it has two commas. And a comma is roughly about half a second if you're thinking about the 
time that someone is pausing at that point. So this means that this second sentence is far quicker to get through. And so when it comes to writing fast paced scenes, lots of short sentences means you're going to have lots of full stops, which actually means the writing will feel slower for readers to get through. It doesn't mean that you can't use short sentences, but it does mean that you should really deeply understand the fact that there are different amounts of times that the reader is pausing for different punctuation. And as a result, having short sentences is actually meaning there's more pauses that has worked into your prose. So for the love of God, please stop saying that short sentences make for fast action packed scenes. That's not the case at all. Now, the way that you actually create good pacing with your prose is by fixing this mistake here of repetitive sentence lengths. So if we take a look at this section here, the forest was dark, the trees were tall, the path was narrow, the wind was cold, she walked slowly. I'm not gonna keep reading the rest of it because you're probably already falling asleep. And that's because every single sentence here is four words long, right? Four words long, four words long, four words long. Uh, oh, this is the one exception, a three word long sentence instead. But the point is when you have lots of repetitive sentence lengths, it really creates this sense of sluggish pacing and it really hinders the flow of the reader going through the story. They begin to get bored, they begin to start skimming the page, it feels very monotonous. If on the other hand, we start to change up the sentence lengths and create more variation, things become far more interesting. So take a look at this example. The forest loomed around her, dark and foreboding. Tall trees cast long, sinister shadows across the narrow path, and a cold wind whispered secrets to the leaves. Shivers ran down her spine as she tread cautiously forward. Her heart raced. Here you can see the variation in the sentence lengths creates so much more engagement within this writing. It feels like there's a much better sense of rhythm to it, and it just flows way nicer. This is also something that Pro Writing Aid is really good at helping you with. So if we come over again to our document here, you can see that there's this sentence length checker of your writing. So if I pull this up and do it on this particular example, you can see the average sentence length here is 33 words long, which is very, very long. Again, I have not written this to be an example of great writing. I've mostly just put it down to show you a lot of these mistakes in action. Um, but you can really see here, it has this cool chart that shows you the different lengths of sentences throughout your book. So ideally, you want there to be a sense of variation between here. It would be a mistake if, you know, we see 20 sentence, uh, 20 word sentence, 20 word sentence, 22 word sentence, 19 word sentence. Those are all going to feel very repetitive. Ideally, you want a nice sense of sort of jaggedness to this chart here. You want the sentence lengths to be nicely variated to really create that sense of rhythm and flow with your writing. And by the way, if you want me to do a full deep dive into Pro Writing Aid, because it has a lot of other features which are incredibly useful for editing your story, if you want me to do a video where I do a full deep dive into this at some point, let me know in the comments down below and that's something I might put together. Okay, this next mistake is something I see new fantasy writers make all the time and you probably have made this mistake as well if it hasn't been pointed out to you. But once it's pointed out to you once, you're going to maybe regret it <laughs> um, just because it is something that I see infusing a lot of amateur pros. And it is this concept of weird anatomical actions. So this sentence here doesn't seem to be doing anything that wrong, right? Her eyes followed him around the room. That's a very common description that I would read in a lot of new pros from a lot of new fantasy writers. But your eyes can't really do that because if you think about the logical ramifications of this sentence here, it feels like the eyes are somehow popping out of the socket and they're just floating around the room following after this, this poor guy here, right? And I know you're probably thinking right now, well, that's not what I mean. And most of my readers know that I actually mean that they're looking at the character going around the room. But if that's what you actually mean, just right, she watched him walk around the room. It feels so much more immediate. And even if most readers will get this second idea here from this first sentence here, I can guarantee you that there is a small subset of readers who will be annoyed. It just doesn't feel anatomically correct to have this first sentence here. And I think that it's always best that you just eliminate that being a potential mistake in your writing. And you just describe the thing that you actually want to happen here. And if you do want to describe it in more abstract terms, you could say her gaze followed him around the room, but don't have her eyes just disconnecting from their sockets and floating after this poor guy, because that's not actually an action that a body part can take. Another mistake that I used to make all the time until I went to university and had this rudely pointed out to me by one of my lecturers was this idea of sentence splices. So take a look at this sentence here. The wizard conjured a fireball, his apprentice stuck behind a table. So that highlighted uh, comma here is kind of being used to just jam these two separate ideas together. And so a sentence splice, which is sometimes also known as a comma splice, basically happens when you take two independent clauses. So the first clause being the wizard conjured a fireball and the second clause being his apprentice stuck behind the table. And you join these two independent clauses with a comma 
instead of using a appropriate conjunction or other punctuation. So really the way that you should join this together is either the wizard conjured a fireball, full stop, his apprentice stuck behind the table, so splitting out those two independent clauses into two different sentences, or you could use the conjunction of and here. The wizard conjured a fireball and his apprentice ducked behind the table. Or you could use a semicolon. The wizard conjured a fireball, his apprentice ducked behind the table. And usually when people are trying to create the effect that leads to this comma splice mistake, they're better off just going with a semicolon because it feels extremely similar. But there is a crucial distinction here. And then the last kind of main option here is the wizard conjured a fireball dash his apprentice ducked behind the table. This here being an M dash. And the reason you wanna avoid the sentence splice here is because it just creates a sense of mushiness in your writing and it feels quite sloppy. In most instances, you're always gonna make it stronger by basically having a, a stronger conjunction. And again, this is a mistake that I had to have pointed out to me when I was going into university and I was doing, a, I think, an English unit or something like that. Um, and I didn't realize it was a mistake when it was first pointed out, but it will really improve your prose if you can get on top of this. So the next mistake is passive voice. Uh, so take a look at this sentence here. The village was destroyed by the dragon. It's not a bad sentence again, and passive voice sometimes gets a bad rap and occasionally it can be something you wanna use to create a particular feeling or a particular emotion in your writing. But for most people, you're gonna be far better off having active voice. So instead saying the dragon destroyed the village. It just feels far more direct. It feels more powerful. And it usually is gonna be faster to bring this sentiment across in active voice compared to passive. To quickly define what passive versus active voice is, in passive voice, the subject, that is the village, receives the action, destroyed by the dragon. Whereas in active voice, the subject, that is the dragon, performs the action of destroying the village. To take another example to just kind of emphasize this point here, this is an example of passive voice. The map was covered with little figurines to mark the army's position, but if you change it to figurine stood on the map to mark the army's position. You can just instantly feel how much more authoritative that is and the clarity and the directness of that language is much more compelling. So here's a few signs that you might be using passive voice in your writing and feel free to kind of use this list as you go through some of your editing passes. Is, so the potion is made by the alchemist. Are, the spells are cast by the wizard rather than saying the wizard cast these spells or the wizard cast the spell. Was, the treasure was found by the adventurers rather than the adventurers found the treasure were, the monsters were defeated by the heroes, been, the prophecy has been told by the oracle, being, the castle is being guarded by dragons. In particular, being is one that feels especially egregious. I don't know why. Uh, it just it annoys me whenever I read it because again, you could make this so much more interesting by saying dragons guarded the castle. It's so much more direct and powerful. And coming back to pro writing aid, this is actually another editing pass that it has in the software. So if we click on the style one up here, it will tell you whenever you're using passive verbs in your writing, uh, and you can see it's also highlighted them in the text. There was a young girl who had been given the name of Aliana, or who were known, and this is a really useful way to basically come through here and clean up any instances of passive writing and find opportunities to make your story and your prose much more direct and more impactful for readers. And the next sentence mistake is ignoring the ending bias. So. The last word in your sentence always gets a special emphasis in the reader's mind because there's that moment after they finish the last word where they're gonna to have to linger on the full stop. And so the last word just has a little bit of extra kick in every sentence. So you can really use this effectively when you wanna emphasize a keyword and make it land. In the case of this first example here, her death wouldn't be a good thing. Thing is our last word and it's not the most important word in that sentence. On the other hand, if we change it to say, he couldn't even think about her death, because that is the last word, it lingers in the reader's mind a little bit more, and so it leverages this ending bias effectively. Now, you're probably thinking right now, well, what if I actually don't wanna emphasize the word death in my sentence? Maybe this first sentence is better, and you're correct. So this is why you just need to be aware of this ending bias, because sometimes you might actually wanna sneak in the key term or the main phrase of your sentence and not have it at the end. Perhaps as a way to underplay a situation or just to create the specific emotional effect you wanna create. And so of course, with this, as with every single technique I'm showing you in this video, it's simply about understanding the principles, the kind of best practices, and then understanding that you can do whatever you want and you can go against all of these ideas if you know what you're doing and you wanna create a particular effect in your story. Sentence mistake number 12 is beige diction. If we take a look at this boring sentence here, the wizard cast a spell, it's just absolute milk toast. Like there's nothing interesting about the sentence at all. 
If on the other hand, we try to make the diction a little bit more specific and powerful and evocative and change it to something like the wizard's fingers wove lines of electric blue through the inky darkness as she cast her spell, it's so much more powerful and so much more impactful. Oftentimes in the first draft, you're going to find yourself writing a lot of sentences like this where it's just about getting the idea down on the page. That is totally fine and I find myself in that camp as well. It's very important that you have an editing pass later on, whether it be in your second or your third or your fourth or fifth draft or whatever, where you come through and you look for opportunities to make things more vivid, specific and immersive. Of course, you don't want to get too carried away with this because then you'll just create purple prose where it's so obvious that you're trying really, really hard to create something beautiful. Sometimes you do just need simple ideas and simple diction, but usually it is a good idea to go through your manuscript and try to find these opportunities to just kind of make things a little bit more special for the reader. Another example here, the ruins were dark. Compare that to, they crept through the crumbling stone fortress, raising their torches in a futile attempt to dispel the inky shadows. Now, the clever eye amongst you might notice that there is a sentence here and you might be thinking right now, hang on, has Jed just written a sentence splice? What is this? But this is actually not a sentence splice, it is a grammatically correct sentence because it isn't used to join two independent clauses. This idea here, they crept through the crumbling stone fortress, that could be an independent clause, that is, it could be a sentence by themselves, but raising their torches in a futile attempt to dispel the inky shadows is not an independent clause. It would need to have they before that. So it would need to be they raise their torches in a futile attempt to dispel the inky shadows. And so because a comma splice only occurs when you're linking two independent clauses together with a comma, then this is not falling into that mistake here. Uh, the technical phrase for what this second half is, is it is a participle phase. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Basically, it is a phrase describing the way in which they crept through the crumbling stone fortress. The next mistake to be aware of are anachronistic words. So. Take a look at this sentence here. That's not gonna work. What genre does that make you think we're reading? Probably makes sense if we're reading like a modern story set in a world like ours, but it feels a little odd if we're reading this sentence in a fantasy story where up until now, it's felt like we're in this kind of medieval feudal England setting. If on the other hand, we just have something simple like that won't work, that feels a lot better. And so this reveals something I often see when I'm editing fantasy writer stories is that Sometimes it's very easy to just slip in common phrases or common slang from our everyday existence without thinking about the fact of, would this logically exist in this world? And would readers believe this to exist in that world? Those are both really important things to be thinking about. And so anachronistic language occurs when you use sort of words or phrases or ideas which don't feel logical or natural to the time or the setting in which your story takes place. And of course, when we're writing our fantasy stories, very important to keep this in mind because we wanna keep readers grounded and immersed in our settings. Common culprits of this mistake include modern slang and idioms, food and materials. So a fun fact I only learned the other day was that uh, Europe only got potatoes in the 16th century and potatoes originated in, I think it was somewhere in South America and they were brought over after the Columbian Exchange. And so if you kind of are setting your story and it's supposed to be in like 9th century Europe or something, don't have the meaning potatoes because that wasn't existing there. Of course, most modern readers might not know this, so you can probably slip that stuff in. And of course, it is a very important to remember you're creating your own fantasy world. You can do whatever you want, right? People can talk however you want them to talk, but it is important that you make them talk in a way where readers believe what they're saying and it all feels truthful. Measurements and units are another area where I sometimes see this. So I don't know what it is, but whenever I read a story, a fantasy story, and they're referring to things like meters or minutes, to me, it just kind of takes me out of it a little bit. I know that these are terms that, you know, have been around for a long time, I suppose, but sometimes when you're a bit too precise or too modern with the measurements in your story, it can be something that drives readers away a little bit and confuses them. And then technology is another thing to think about as well. If you have a bunch of books in your fantasy world, but this is not a world where they have developed like a printing press or some sort of industrialized book production process, and yet the characters are just sort of reading like the regular you know, paperbacks you might get, like the ones on the shelf behind me here, it's gonna feel a little bit disconcerting. And really that's just the main thing to keep in mind here is you just want internal consistency and internal logic. And again, it's your fantasy world, you can do whatever the heck you want with it, as long as you make it feel logical and believable to the reader. Mistake number 14 is ignoring the Oxford comma. So I'm also not sponsored by Oxford. I don't even think that's a thing that they do. But basically, if we look at this sentence here, um, she summoned her trusty companions, a wizard and a dragon. It's actually a little bit confusing because her trusty companions, that could refer to the wizard and the dragon as one entity, 
So she summoned her trusty companions, a wizard and a dragon, as like one concept. Or if we actually put the Oxford comma in, which is this second comma here that comes before the end, she summoned her trusty companions, that's one group or one people, uh, a wizard, that's another person, and a dragon, that's a third person. The Oxford comma makes it abundantly clear that these are three distinctive items in a list. Whereas when you don't use the Oxford comma as in our first example here, it can sometimes get confusing as to what you're actually referring to. Is she summoning three separate entities? That is the trusty companions, the wizard and the dragon. Or is this wizard and the dragon somehow the same idea, the same creature, and that's who she is summoning when she's summoning her trusty companions. Mistake number 15, thoughtless adverbs. So take a look at this sentence here. The young mage cast his spells skillfully. If you've read Stephen King's On Writing, you're probably recalling right now that sentence where he says, the path to hell is paved with adverbs and he goes on this massive rant about how bad adverbs are. And most of the time when you're getting advice about how to write better prose, a common piece of advice is don't have adverbs there because usually what adverbs do is they're just a lazy way of expressing your ideas. It's so much better to actually vividly describe, and there you go, I did use an adverb there. It's so much better to be more interesting with your descriptions, such as this second sentence. Fire danced from the mage's fingers, forming a twisting pattern of sparkling light. So this is really the thing to be avoiding. It's just thoughtless adverbs. They're fine if you're using them thoughtfully with intention, but when you're just kind of chucking them in because you didn't really know the evocative and vivid way to describe something, that's usually a mistake. And every time you see an adverb in your writing, it's an opportunity to create something far more beautiful as we have with this second sentence here. This is also another area where you can just go into Microsoft Word or whatever else you're writing in. You can do a control find search and you can literally just look for the letter L, the letter Y, and then probably like a space after it or a full stop after it just to make sure you're not seeing these two letters inside another word. Most of the time adverbs are gonna end with L-Y. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, those are the ones you wanna be looking at changing. And this leads to our next mistake, which is very similar, generic verbs. So the ranger moved quickly through the woods. We're getting a sense of the pace at which the ranger is moving through. That is, they're moving quickly. They're not ambling, they're not strolling. But in many instances, and again, this is an adverb we can see here quickly, you're so much better off saying the ranger sprinted through the woods. That is taking the generic verb of move, which can then be modified with tons of other adverbs, and instead making something more specific. Just looking at ways to move, as you can see from this list here, there's like literally 60 different ways that a character can move just based off this list. And I'm probably missing a bunch of others as well. You can have someone walking, but that's very different to them lumbering or hopping or sliding or lurking. And every single one of these specific verbs gives you a much better sense of the character's personality, of the situation, and just the way that they're actually proceeding throughout the world. And you can do this with just about every single generic verb in your writing. But of course, just because I've given you this big list of different ways to move, mean, doesn't mean that you should make the next mistake, which is developing a thesaurus brain. Um, it basically just means that you get a little bit too carried away with looking up synonyms for every word in your prose in the thesaurus. So take a look at this sentence here. When it pertained to gentacular matters, his ultra crepidarian uncle became quite the philodox. I'm not even sure if I pronounced all of that right. Just have a guess right now. I want you to think, what exactly does this sentence mean? Because there is actually a meaning here. This is technically a logical sentence. Okay, I hope you've got your answer. Basically, it, it's pretty much the same thing as this sentence here. His opinionated uncle loved to share his thoughts on just about everything, but especially breakfast. So, gentacular means pertaining to breakfast. Ultra crepidarian is uh, someone who basically is super presumptuous and offers advice and opinions beyond their, their sort of knowledge and their understanding. Uh, and then philodox is someone who loves uh, their own opinions. They have an excessive interest in their own opinions. But it's so much better if you just tell readers what you actually mean, because most people probably have no idea what you're talking about here. And sometimes when you're trying to write better prose in your fantasy story, you fall into this trap of trying to be really clever and having lots of synonyms for your writing to make it feel more uh, vivid and more interesting and more unique and more special and beautiful. But it leads to absolute like nightmares like this. So by all means, use the synonyms uh, to you know make your verbs more interesting or to spice up your prose, but don't get too carried away with this. Still try to write stuff that people actually understand. And on a similar note, this brings us to mistake number 18, silly dialogue tags. So I'm about to show you one of the most memed dialogue tags in all of fantasy writing. You may have seen this example before. It is a real example from a real book that has sold 
millions, probably even hundreds of millions of copies. Are you ready? Snape, ejaculated Slughorn, who looked the most shaken, pale and sweating. That is genuinely a real line of dialogue from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Um, you can also see there's no Oxford comma here, which I would have pre personally preferred to include. Um, now, I do love Harry Potter, so I'm not like taking a dump on this story, but it's just kind of a bit ridiculous, right? Like, come on, come on, you know what you're doing here. It's just so much better to be straight to the point and just say, Snape, said Slughorn. So sometimes people can get a little bit carried away with their dialogue tags, but in most instances, the word said is gonna be more than enough. Another area where uh, writers get into trouble here is when they use dialogue tags that aren't actually ways of speaking. So for example, this sentence is stupid, scowled Jed. You can't actually scowl a word. You can scowl before you say a word, or you can scowl after you say a word, or during I suppose, but scowling is not a way to emit sound waves from your mouth in order to produce speech. So most of the time, you're gonna be better off using said. Said also has the incredible benefit of being almost an invisible word to readers. They're just so desensitized to seeing after dialogue tags that you can use it again and again and again without it feeling repetitive, without it annoying the readers. But on the other hand, if you think that you need to change it up every time and it's boring to have said every single sentence in a row, that's when you start to really get into the mistakes and then the readers will pay more attention to your dialogue tags than the dialogue itself. Really, you kind of want the dialogue tags to be almost invisible. Every now and again, you might throw in a shouted or whispered or something like that, but generally you wanna be very minimal and selective with those because the focus should be on what the characters are actually saying. And also, if the characters are saying something, but you don't think that the emotion or the way in which they're saying it is clear, and it's forcing you to put in this weird dialogue tag after, it might actually mean that you need to write better dialogue in the first place. Mistake number 19 is describing what isn't happening. Take a look at this phrase here. You lied to me, she said. He didn't say anything. This is a very common way of writing a little scene like this, but it's not particularly interesting because we're not actually having a constructive description here. If on the other hand we change it and we have, he turned away and stared out the window, now we are actually describing something that is happening. If in many ways, if you look at this first example, it's almost like a paradox, right? He didn't say anything. Maybe you could write, he stayed silent, and that feels a bit more constructive and a bit more active. But you do wanna be making sure you're mindful of this mistake because in pretty much every instance, you are missing an opportunity to give the character an action that still implies the original meaning you were attempting to communicate, but also adds another layer of something else. In other words, you're writing a constructive sentence which is progressing the reader's understanding in some way. And the mistake number 20, weasel words. So take a look at this sentence here. The knight spoke very softly to her friend. Very is one of those words that you might have a tendency to just chuck into your writing as a way to kind of just emphasize a thing you're trying to describe. But in most cases, it's weak. And if you simply cut something like that, you're gonna end up with a more powerful sentence. Like the knight whispered to her friend is better than spoke very softly to her friend. So weasel words are phrases that are vague or non-committal and they often dilute the impact of the true meaning you're attempting to get across in your story. Here's another example. The ancient book was apparently full of a lot of powerful spells. So these are weasel words and you could also make the argument these are bubble wrap words or glue words as well. The ancient book brimmed with powerful spells is much more impactful and much better because we've cut out those annoying weasel words there. Here's a massive list of some example weasel words that you can be cutting out in your story as well. Words like very, quiet, rather, just, really, pretty in particular. This one down here is one that comes up quite often when I'm editing different stories. So again, this is something where you can basically be searching through your manuscript when you're editing it for each of these words and just looking for ways to either delete them or change them to become more powerful descriptions. So now that you have a much better understanding of how to write great individual sentences in your fantasy novel, you might wanna check out this video over here to see how you can take the tools from this video and apply them to writing better descriptions in your fantasy book.